before I get going, I want to first of all acknowledge uh, Dr. Shinju Her. Shinju, please stand up. He's the one that's done all this work over all these years. So uh, without, without Dr. Her, this thing doesn't go. So Shinju, thanks a lot for everything you've done. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff we've been doing, and uh, I'm going to leave some time afterwards to go ahead and ask questions, but if you would like, go ahead and stop me and ask questions as I'm going. Okay, not to put you guys to sleep. All right, we, uh, we have this uh, innate hardwired thing of, of uh, pushing the envelope, of, of traveling, and if you look at uh, early... Uh, Mythology and what have you, or our, our interest as humankind in, uh, in uh, pursuing uh, space and being able to fly is, is something that's been going on for, for some time here. But we've always had this, this deal here. And, and are you sure about this stand? It seems odd that a pointy head and a long beak is what makes them fly, you know? So this has been going on for some period of time. Uh, just to kind of put things in their uh, proper perspective, uh, particularly I think since we're uh, Again, you know, part of our part of our nature is is uh, discovery and always pushing the envelope. It was only about 500 years ago that Columbus uh, came over here, and uh, they weren't exactly sure about what the heck they were getting into. Columbus was a darn good navigator, but they weren't exactly sure about what they were getting into. And uh, if you if you look from the standpoint of what's happened in aeronautics, uh, it's only been about 100 years ago that the uh, Wright brothers out in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Uh, we're, we're basically having the first self-propelled uh, air flight that occurred, and that was basically going 30 miles an hour, and that was with a 20 mile an hour tailwind. So we have come a long ways uh, in a relatively short period of time from the standpoint of humankind. And if you look also too, for instance, at, at some of the stuff that happened after World War II with the, uh, the pushing of the sound barrier, Chuck Yeager, there's a really great, great read. Uh, 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 the right stuff that uh, if you've, if you've, if you've uh, ever have a chance to, to read that, it's, it's about 30 plus years old, but Tom Wolf wrote, wrote a really great book, and it's, it's about that whole period of time after World War II with uh, the, the breaking of the sound barrier and Jaeger and that crew and the early astronauts and what have you. It's a really, really fascinating read. Uh, about 40 plus years ago, we made it to the, uh, to the moon, and right now there's a push for NASA to go back to the moon as well too. So this happened with a relatively short period of time for, I know many of you folks may not have remembered, but Sputnik in the late 1950s really shook up this country that the Ruskies were going to take over and what have you. And there was a big push when uh, Kennedy came in to, to actually get a, get a man on the moon relatively quickly in a short period of time. That was probably the most focused time NASA was ever at. Um, one of the things that's always been of real interest to the astronauts and the cosmonauts has, has been working with plants. Uh, because one of the things about being in space is you have a very desolate environment. And one of the things they've always enjoyed, there are some seats down here if, if you're looking for some extra seats. One of the things that uh, the astronauts and the cosmonauts have always enjoyed about doing experiments with plants is a lot of times they get to eat the experiment afterwards. And that's not too bad because it's got some turgor to it and it, it, uh, it's, it's got some, uh, some flavor and some aroma, which is much better than these uh, processed foods they have to deal with. As you're all aware, being horticulturists, uh, one of the things we know that you know, humans are involved in doing is, of course, consuming food, and, and they need oxygen, and, and they respire a lot. A lot of CO2 is given off. Actually, in this room, as we sit here, we're respiring at around 50,000 parts per million. That's a lot of carbon dioxide. That's maybe why we get sleepy and dizzy and what have you. So getting rid of carbon dioxide is, re is a real issue that, the, uh, that they have in these co very confined uh, areas. And of course, uh, we take clean water and we make it into non-clean water very quickly. And the whole idea with plants, obviously, is you can go ahead, you can fix CO2, you can go through this process of photosynthesis with water. Uh, there's the, the byproduct of oxygen as well as carbohydrates being produced. There's this thing called phytoremediation, which is an area of horticulture we really should be looking more at. But phytoremediation is we can basically take contaminated water and other contaminated sites and go ahead and make that into clean water type systems. And ultimately, what they would like to do is to get into a closed-loop system of being able to go ahead and do that. They are nowhere close to being a closed-loop system, but this is ultimately the goal of what they would like to go ahead and do. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I will just point out a few, few things here, and that is, for instance, CO2 removal. This becomes really important because, again, uh, you can run into toxicity levels with the amount of CO2 that we normally respire. Um, 
the fact that there are very high CO2 levels associated with humans means that we don't really care about C4 plants. C3 plants, the plants that fix, uh, they're involved with, with C3, tomatoes, tomatoes, uh, lettuce, and what have you, those plants really uh, do much, much better and are more advantageous because, again, there's, there's access to high CO2 levels. The other thing, too, from the standpoint of recycling, anything that's got liquid to it uh, gets recycled, whether it happens to be urine or what have you. About the only thing that doesn't get recycled is going to be feces, which they will freeze dry and that gets shipped off. But everything else gets, gets recycled on the International Space Station and these, these uh, spacecraft. Okay. The problem, a uh, very tough environment here for plants on a lunar and Martian uh, type of system. Atmospheric pressure of the moon is basically at, uh, at, at zero pressure. It's, it's, a, it's a vacuum. Uh, Mars is around one one hundredth of the Earth's. There's gravity issues to deal with as well, too. Uh, the day length is another issue as well, too. The moon, basically, the, the lunar month is 29 and a half days, and half of that time is in dark, and half that time is in light. So if you're a plant, how the heck are you going to be able to go ahead and, and, and deal with these light issues, having access to light. They're going to have to figure out ways of being able to recapture and, and be able to go ahead and, and, uh, and use light. Some other issues, too. The Martian atmosphere is about 95 percent carbon dioxide. Uh, in Mars, there's about half the light that we have here on Earth. There's no carbon on the moon, so that's going to be an issue from the standpoint of uh, photosynthetic situation. Uh, light's going to have to be captured. and uh, I, I hate to say it, but we're going nuclear, guys. Uh, uh, this is going to be ways that we're able to go ahead and, and we regenerate energy and be able to go ahead and, and produce light. Um, the travel to Mars is a big issue as well, too. And uh, that's the logistics of that is, are, are quite, quite extreme. It's, it's basically a three-year process, and everything has to be properly uh, lined up. Um, <clears throat> we simply can't cram enough food into a spaceship these days to be able to go ahead and make a successful trip like that. Uh, one of the things that goes on with these bioregenerative life support systems is uh, there's, there is the, uh, the main primary use is for physical chemical means of going ahead and scrubbing, removing carbon dioxide from the air, of using physical chemical means for going ahead and artificially producing oxygen and what have you. So really, plants are kind of meant to, to supplement that rather as being the primary sources of that. Um, <clears throat> Plants are, are also going to be used as supplemental food source. And again, uh, NASA has what they call their salad, salad bowl program, salad bar program. And that basically is uh, uh, crops that can be turned over relatively quickly uh, and made, it, made accessible to the crew. All right, the currency of space, some of the issues we're dealing with here. Um, in terms of power, energy costs to produce power, uh, generating light for plants is a big, big uh, cost for them. Uh, other issues, too, are also mass is weight. It's, it's very expensive to ship stuff up into space. The, uh, the, the dollars on one kilogram is, is incredibly high. Uh, and, it, and, you know, there's numbers all over the place. But it's very, very expensive to ship things into space from the standpoint of what, what the costs are. Um, also, too, the vacuum of space makes uh, large transport structures very difficult to build as well, too. All right, some of the advantages of, of, uh, of low pressure and why we, we're even considering uh, working with low pressure is that there's, there's less, less structural needs that need to be shipped into space. So in other words, we can go ahead, we can reduce some of the mass requirements that we would normally have if we wanted to go ahead and create an earth ambient type of, of pressure. Because if we wanted to have an earth ambient type of pressure uh, where we're talking on the moon where basically it's, it's, it's a vacuum, you have to have all the superstructure. So you've got these issues of superstructure of mass. Um, you also have issues of leakage as well, too. You also have issues of safety as well. So all these things uh, come, in, come, into, uh, come into being. Uh, the crew, for instance, could, could uh, tend crops without having to uh, suit up. And uh, one of the things, the, the folks who were involved in the Apollo program, they were around 30 kilopascals. Normal atmospheric pressure is around 101 kilopascals. So at 30 kilopascals, provided you've got supplementary oxygen, people can tolerate that. To give you an idea, like Everest is around 28 kilopascals and everything. So people, to a degree, can tolerate those types of things, provided supplementary oxygen is there. The, one of the other advantages, too, for instance, is that if they go ahead and they suit up, typically they suit up. And the EVA pressure there is around 35 kilopascals. So if you're at 101, you have to go kind of through a process that's similar for any of you guys who go scuba diving and go deep diving. 
it's kind of similar to, to deep breathing that goes on with the bends. It's kind of the reverse that has to go on. So if there was an emergency and you're going to go from an earth ambient, very high pressure, to a lower pressure, there's this deep breathing process that goes on. You can't automatically just get in and you're okay. You've got to go through that process. So if you've got people at a lower pressure, you, uh, you overcome some of those issues. All right. The, uh, the pressures that we're working at are, are around 25, uh, 25 uh, kilopascals. And so normal ambient pressure is around 101 kilopascals. We're at around 25. As I mentioned, for instance, the folks that go up to Everett, Everest are around 28 kilopascals. And the, 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 uh, the astronauts who were involved with the Apollo program were around 33 or so kilopascals. And one of the things that happens is as you start to decrease pressure, um, there, is, there's a, there are differences in, in gaseous diffusion that starts to take place. So gaseous diffusion starts to increase. And also a plant also has what we call boundary layer. This is what we call boundary layer resistance. And as you start to go ahead and as you decrease pressure, you actually reduce the boundary layer resistance. So one of the issues you can run into is if you get down to very, very low total pressure conditions, you can actually have potential problems with desiccation. The plants can desiccate much more rapidly. At the 25 kilopascals we're working at, that really has not been uh, an issue for us uh, at all. All right, chemistry 101, the stuff you really hated. But um, this is all the, the perfect gas law, and we, we use it. Um, all the time in the work we're doing. And it all has to do with pressure times volume and, and moles and temperature, and there's also a, a constant here as well, too. So if we're at Earth ambient, which is 101 kilopascals, most of the, uh, the gaseous composition is going to be made of nitrogen, and we have 21, 21 uh, kilopascals of oxygen, which is the normal oxygen levels at sea level. And then at this particular situation, we're working at 100 pascals of CO2, and that's equivalent to 1,000 parts per million of CO2. Earth ambient CO2 is around 380 now and increasing as we talk. So we're, we're basically, we're growing plants that are about 25 kilopascals, uh, 25 kilopascals, about 25% normal atmospheric pressure. And you'll also notice that the partial pressure of oxygen is also reduced as well, too, under these lower total pressure conditions. All right, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through this other than it's basically a six-chambered acrylic uh, system we have that Ron Lacey and some of his graduate students were involved in developing. Uh, the system allows us to be able to go ahead and monitor CO2 so we can go ahead, we can, do, get, we can get gas exchange measurements during the day where we're measuring photosynthesis, and we can also get gas exchange at night where we're measuring dark period respiration. And this is, this is the chamber system here, and it's over in the, uh, the Borlaug Center. And it's a very nice system that's been, that uh, Ron and company have developed over there. And there are six chambers, so we can run concurrent replicated experiments. And one of the problems that's, that's been uh, with low pressure work that's been reported in the past, whether it was from Japan or Kennedy Space Center, was that uh, there was really no replication in what they were doing. And you have to replicate stuff, or it's apples versus pears. And so the system allows us to be able to go ahead and we can have one chamber under low pressure, another chamber under high pressure. We can change the partial pressures of oxygen if we want to, to high or low, depending on what we wanted to do. As you get up into altitude, as you, for instance, climb a mountain, the pressure starts to go ahead and decreases. There's, the pressure gets lower, but you also run into issues of lower oxygen, hypoxia, lower oxygen. That's why they take supplementary oxygen for those folks that go up to Mount Everest, or many of them do. You also run into issues, too, of differences in light quality. So the blue light, for instance, changes and what have you. So you have light quality issues. You've got temperature issues. You've got oxygen issues. And you've got low pressure issues. So and those are all confounding effects. And it's always been very difficult to do biology based on, on altitude uh, conditions. And so this system really allows us to go ahead and, and separate out some of the differences between low pressure versus, versus low oxygen. All right, um, just kind of an overview here. What we're, I'm going to take you through relatively quickly is looking at some of these uh, photosynthetic performance, like at CO2 response curves. This has to do with photosynthesis, uh, carbo carb carboxylation efficiency. We'll be looking at compensation point. 
And then, um, as you're all aware, there, there are a number of factors affecting photosynthesis. That could be light, low versus high light, temperature, drought, oxygen, all these factors be, go ahead and affect photosynthesis. And then I'm going to be talking about ethylene. And ethylene is a big problem in, in confined environments, a huge problem in confined environments, which causes really a regular growth to go ahead and occur. All right, so just kind of breaking this down a little bit here, looking at, uh, we're working with lettuce here, and what we're going to be taking a look at here is, is hyperbaric conditions, and we're also going to be looking at hypoxia as well, too. And hypoxia, again, is low oxygen. So this is low oxygen, hypoxia, and hyperbaria is going to be low pressure, looking at some of the factors going on in terms of gas exchange and plant growth and development. All right, uh, if we take a look at a ten, typical 10-day cycle, and, and typically we grow our plants for over about a 10-day period of time. The seedlings are around 22 days, about 20 days old at the time we transplant them. And this, what you're seeing basically is this 100, this 100 uh, pascals, which is around 1,000 parts per million of CO2, which is a supplementary level of CO2 they're exposed to. This is during the daytime. This is the nighttime. And you can see over time how the, the dark period of respiration goes ahead and, and increases over time. And this is low pressure, and, uh, and the, your, you've got your, your night CO2 levels, which are being used to measure dark period respiration. And these are ambient pressure plants at, at uh, ambient levels of, of uh, oxygen. And there's about a 20 or 25 percent higher level uh, dark period respiration that occurs with uh, ambient pressure plants compared to low pressure, but the photosynthetic levels are the same. The biomass production is going to be the same. All right, so just taking a look at an experiment like this where we can go ahead and we can replicate things up here. Uh, what we've got is we've got basically a two by three factorial. So we have low pressure, 25 kilopascals, compared to ambient pressure. And we have, we have ambient levels of, of uh, oxygen. This would be oxygen you'd find at sea level. And then we're having decreasing levels of oxygen. And this six kilopascals is going to be a very hypoxic condition where uh, the levels get extremely low, about one-third one -third the normal amount that, that, uh, that occurs. And what you notice with CO2 assimilation, all this means, this has to do with photosynthesis. So if we go ahead and we take a look at, at day 10 here, um, if, if we look at the, uh, the uh, normal, uh, normal oxygen level between uh, ambient, ambient pressure versus low pressure, no differences here at all. And even at 12 kilopascals, a reduction in oxygen, no differences here. But what you're noticing, for instance, here is that the ambient pressure plants, the photosynthetic levels, are much lower when they become very oxygen stressed at this high, at this low level. Even though the, uh, the 25 kilopascal one, uh, the low pressure one, also has a decrease, it's still, it's, it's still higher than that of the, uh, the ambient uh, total pressure plant. And if we look at dark period respiration, this is what's going on at night. It's a comparable type of relationship that also goes on. There's a decrease that's occurring in, uh, in uh, dark period uh, respiration. And again, one of the characteristics we're finding, again, with, with, the, uh, um, <clears throat> with the high pressure, the, with the ambient pressure plants, is that there's, again, there's a tendency for dark period respiration to be, to be higher. If we look at CO2 assimilation, the dark period respiration ratio, and this is basically just a measurement we do to uh, to look at the efficiency of, of carbohydrates being used during dark period res respiration. Um, what you'll notice again when we get into a very oxygen stress type of, of environment, uh, there is a reduction that's gone on with this, this ratio. So efficiencies are, are, are getting reduced under lower oxygen conditions. But the efficiency of the low pressure plants are higher than that of the ambient total pressure plants. So there's some things going on here. If we look at uh, plant growth here, um, there's really no difference at all between this is ambient total pressure and this is low pressure. There's really no differences between 12 and 21 uh, kilopascals of oxygen. It's only when we start to get into low oxygen conditions here and also low oxygen conditions here that we start to see some real reductions in growth. And one of the things you'll see is that leaf area is, is much smaller, uh, even with the hyperbaric plants, compared to uh, higher levels of oxygen. And the same thing's going on with the ambient total pressure plants. Um, some other things you'll notice, too, for instance, is that root, root uh, dry mass is, is really affected by that. And roots are very sensitive. That's one of the things we know as horticulturists, is that roots are very sensitive to uh, low oxygen conditions. And actually, the greatest reduction in growth is, cur is occurring with uh, the below ground system, the root system, and not, not the tops. And some other th characteristics we've noticed, too, about low pressure is that the chlorophyll levels tend to be higher 
under hyperbaric conditions, low pressure conditions. And there is some classic work that was done by Berg and Berg a number of years ago. And they also reported that hypoberia uh, actually enhances chlorophyll levels as well, too. If we look at the, uh, the real low oxygen levels, one of the things you're noticing is the specific leaf area. And that's a way we can go ahead. We actually get, it's a way we measure leaf thickness. And a lot of times when you've got stresses, leaves tend to get thicker. So one of the things you're noticing is that as we get, as we get down to, uh, to, uh, to uh, lower oxygen conditions, the actual thickness of the leaf is, is increasing as well, too. Again, that's indicative of a stress type of situation occurring there. Where we find some differences is in relative growth rates. And even though relative growth rates have, have decreased significantly uh, with the uh, low pressure plants, under low oxygen conditions, the relative growth rate is higher than that of, that of the ambient total pressure plants at low oxygen. So again, there's some growth differences going on here between these two systems. To give you an idea of how this progresses and everything, this is day zero. So these seedlings would have been grown for 22 days. They're put into the chambers. We're going to go ahead and we'll run them for 10 days in the, in the chambers. So this is a day zero. This is a day five. And this is the day 10. So these plants, they, these plants go ahead and develop uh, very, very quickly. These are non-stress conditions. This is uh, ambient, ambient total pressure. This is low pressure. So these are non-restricting oxygen conditions, and there's really no differences in growth at all, biomass between low pressure versus high pressure. All right, uh, so growth is comparable between uh, low pressure versus ambient pressure plants during these 10-day studies. Uh, the low oxygen that goes on there definitely goes ahead and reduces plant growth. And this is related to oxidative phosphorylation. So most likely oxidative phosphorylation is becoming limited here. Uh, the low oxygen uh, causes a greater carbon reduction in stress with the ambient than with the uh, low pressure plants. And there's also a trend in, in lower specific leaf area, uh, leaf and total plant dry, mace, dry mass. That's not, that's not significant. It's just a trend that's occurring in that direction. Uh, leaf chlorophyll is higher in low pressure than ambient. And uh, again, relative water content, that's, that's something that we, we will use we'll, uh, when we measure water relations. We might measure leaf, leaf water potential, relative water content. Uh, we, we've never been able to find any differences at all between low pressure versus high pressure. So at 25 kilopascals, we're really not at that point where we're starting to see any desiccation type issues. All right. Uh, the 25, uh, 12 kilopascals of oxygen is comparable, has a comparable CO2 assimilation, and it's got about a 20 to 25 percent lower dark period respiration than ambient uh, pressure plants. There's a, a greater efficiency of CO2 assimilation to the dark period ratio with low pressure plants under low oxygen conditions. And again, this is probably related to the greater diffusion rate that's going on there and the reduction in the boundary uh, layer resistance that goes on under low pressure conditions. Again, it's easier, for, it's easier for carbon dioxide to get into the leaf mesophyll and be, be taken up under those, those low pressure conditions. Um, some other stuff as well, too, and one of the things that, that has come out in the literature is that uh, there was some work done at Florida, and um, they were looking at hy hypoberia versus hypoxia. And uh, they, uh, they basically found that there were less than half the genes were upregulated up or downregulated in response to hypoberia is unique. So in other words, bottom line there is that hypoberia is very, very different than hypoxia. The two are not, are not the same. Uh, there's been some other work also, too, where uh, looking at uh, Rubisco, et cetera, and some other of these phyto, uh, photorespiratory enzymes where there's no altered regulation uh, that goes, under, goes on under these um, hypoberic uh, conditions. All right, taking a look at uh, CO2 saturation curve, and what we're trying to do here is we're, we're looking at a couple of things. We're going to be looking at light. So we're going to be looking at a low light level, and this is really not a very low light level when it comes to space environments. So I think what, what you're ultimately going to see, um, typically in a room like this when there's lights on, we're probably at around 30, 30 uh, micromole, micromole or so. And uh, what we're basically going to see, I think, long term is we're going to find plants that are able to tolerate maybe in the, you know, do, do pretty well at about 75 micromoles. In other words, very, very low light levels, plants that are genetically engineered to go ahead and tolerate that. But what we're looking at is two levels here, 240 and 600 micromoles of light. And one of the things you'll notice is that the, um, the, the, low, light, the low light actually reduces the CO2 sat saturation um, point here. So low light goes ahead and, and reduces it. So it saturates much more quickly here. 
Um, also, too, there's a difference in low pressure as well, too. The, uh, the low pressure also tends to go ahead and, and reduce the, uh, the, the uh, CO2 saturation curve as well, too. So we see it down here, and we also see it over here where it's actually redoing it. So in terms of CO2 saturation curve, there's both, a, uh, there's both a, a pressure effect as well as a light effect. If we look at the CO2 compensation curve, and the CO2 compensation is basically where we're looking at that equilibrium that occurs between photosynthesis and also between uh, respiration. And <clears throat> what we've got here is that, again, we're looking at two different light levels, 600 and also 240. And what we're seeing is that the highlight, the highlight conditions, that's the 600 over here, so the highlight conditions over here reduces the CO2, the CO2 compensation point or the CO2 compensation curve much more quickly than the low light. We're not seeing any differences at all between total pressures. The total pressure is not having any effect at all under the CO, for the CO2 compensation curves. And this is just kind of a review of it. Uh, looking at, at, the, at the end point here, the actual CO2 compensation point, again, the, the higher, the higher uh, light lowers the compensation point. Um, when, when you've got sufficient light here. So it's basically under these, these conditions here of sufficient light that we have a reduction in the CO2 compensation point with higher light conditions, but not a pressure response. Okay, so basically here what we've got is low pressure has a reduced, C, has a reduced CO2 saturation point compared with ambient. Uh, low, low light uh, also has a reduced CO2 saturation point compared with higher light. And if we also look at uh, low, uh, low partial pressures of oxygen, uh, lowered the CO2 compensation point for both the, the uh, low pressure as well as the ambient pressure plants. And what's going on here is basically there's reduced oxygen competing, competing with uh, carbon dioxide for rubisco. Rubisco, that enzyme that goes ahead and fixes uh, carbon dioxide. There's competition that goes on between CO2 and oxygen. And the reduced, the reduced uh, oxygen basically uh, is, is, is involved here with competing with CO2 with, uh, with Rubisco. So that's, that's one of the reasons we're seeing some differences here. Uh, total pressure had no significant effect on the CO2 compensation point here. All right, ethylene is a big issue, as I mentioned. And um, if, you, if you look at some of the reports by Salisbury and some of the other folks who were involved with the International Space Station, one of the problems they would uh, run into is they would have very irregular growth that would, would occur with, with wheat. They would have very poor seed set that would occur as well, too. And part of that was due to ethylene, because when you get in a really, really confined environment, you can have problems with ethylene starting to go ahead and build up. And one of the things that we noticed with our chambers that were built here was that over time, we would start to have high ethylene levels occur as well, too. And if you consider like the chambers that we work with, those chambers have a leak rate of something like 1% for every 24 hours. A really good growth chamber probably has a leakage rate of something like, I don't know, in excess of 95%. So we were working with a really, really tight system. And when you've got a really, really tight system, you can start to get ethylene building up. And ethylene, as you know, is autocatalytic, meaning that once you get a little bit of ethylene there, it goes a long way of producing a lot more ethylene. And that becomes a big issue in a confined environment. So here's an example. This is ethylene accumulating, being allowed to naturally accumulate. And here we've gone ahead and we've scrubbed it in the system. So we have a system of being able to use potassium permanganate to go ahead and take the ethylene out. And here's 101 normal atmospheric pressure. And here's 25 kilopascals, which is the low pressure conditions. And one of the things you'll start to see over time, again, this is a 10-day study here. So as those plants are getting larger and they're putting on more leaf, more biomass, um, more, more production, more photosynthetic levels, you're seeing the ethylene levels get very high here. This one here is for 1,000 a thousand, a thousand nanomoles. 1,000 nanomoles is equal to 1,000 parts per billion. Most ethylene outside is maybe two, three parts per billion. So we're going from two to three parts per billion, which is normal, to basically getting up to 1,000 parts per billion. That's very, very high levels. And when you start to do that, one of the things you'll start to see is, if you look at the ambient pressure, ambient pressure plants here, if we look at the photosynthetic levels here, if you scrub it, the, the photosynthetic levels are much higher than when the ethylene is accumulating. So the ethylene is actually is causing a reduction occurring in photosynthetic levels. And the same trend occurs also, too, in, in terms of dark period respiration going on at night. The scrub material, 
the scrub plants um, in those chambers that, were, that had the ethylene removed have much higher levels of dark period respiration, and we're finding lower levels occurring where the ethylenes have been allowed to naturally accumulate. And the same relationship also goes on with low pressure. And one of the things we were thinking was that, you know, maybe with low pressure we might be able to go ahead and reduce some of the uh, ethylene levels. And there's about a 17% less ethylene that occurs under low pressure conditions, but it's still way too high. And so, uh, bottom line is they're going to have to use systems where they can scrub for ethylene to be able to go ahead and, and remove it if they're going to be growing plants under confined in environment situations for long-term habitation. And if we just take a look at that, uh, again, these are very, very high levels that are, that are accumulating here under ambient uh, total pressure conditions. These are still way, way too high even under low pressure conditions as well too. And that, that again causes problems with depressing photosynthetic levels as well so, and also depressing dark period respiration as well. Um, if we look at, at growth responses, uh, in terms of growth responses, um, because you've got depressed photosynthetic levels uh, due to ethylene, you're also going to have depressed growth levels. And one of the problems that's always been in terms of doing photosynthesis type work is a lot of times it's, it's difficult to actually relate photosynthetic levels to biomass because that doesn't always hold as nicely as we'd like it to hold. But we've been very fortunate with the system we're working with and with the lettuce crops we've been working with where we can show that direct relationship going on here. So again, what you're seeing is um, when, we have, when the ethylene's allowed to accumulate, there's decreases in leaf area, uh, leaf dry mass, root dry mass, all this biomass is actually being reduced. And, and uh, again, there's really no differences in relative water content. So water's not an issue here, but with both the uh, low pressure as well as ambient pressure plants, when they're allowed to naturally accumulate ethylene, there's depression that goes on both with gas exchange as well as with growth. And if you look at it, here's the ethylene that's been allowed to scrub. It's been scrubbed here. And this is, this is ambient pressure here. This is low pressure here. When they're allowed to go ahead and naturally accumulate ethylene, you can see what happens with the growth responses. So the growth is significantly reduced there. And there are significant reductions also going on in, in, in photosynthetic levels as well, too. So it's a nice correlation to show what's going on there. And again, this is just some other stuff where we went ahead and we looked at uh, ethylene concentrations and, and we did this over a duration, uh, over a period of time. And what you're seeing with, with photosynthetic levels over a period of time as, as the uh, ethylene levels are allowed to accumulate over time, there's a dramatic in reduction in photosynthetic levels going on. And there's also a very dramatic reduction in dark period respiration going on as well. So ethylene basically uh, reduces, uh, reduces photosynthetic levels. It reduces dark period respiration. Uh, that's also attributed to growth. There's a reduction in, in growth that also goes on with these accumulation of ethylene. And uh, basically, there's, no, there's really no significant effect with low pressure on affecting ethylene. It's still going to be an issue with low pressure situations as well, too. In the literature, uh, in terms of ethylene and, and carbon dioxide assimilation and photosynthesis, there's been a lot of different reports in the, in the literature uh, that ethylene does not have a direct effect on photosynthetic levels. Um, there's also reports that ethylene-induced epinasty reduces light interception of leaves. There's this, there's this epinastic effect that goes on with ethylene. And what will happen is it's kind of like an upright. There's an upright appearance as it starts to be exposed to ethylene. And what that will do is with light normally being able to go ahead and hit a leaf on a, on a, on a direct contact, if you start to have changes in the orientation, then there's not as much light actually hitting that leaf surface. So those are some of these epinastic effects going on. And what we, what we basically have found in this research is that it, there's both a, uh, a direct effect of, of, uh, of ethylene on uh, stomatal and mesophyll effects as well as this epinastic effect going on. All right, <clears throat> enough of the data. Uh, just, just to go ahead and, and, and do some, some potential visuals of, of what we might ultimately get in, into, and, and probably, probably one of the, the best analogs of, of what people deal with is, is the South Pole. Because on the South Pole, essentially half of the year, you're in the dark. And so they actually have salad bowl programs down there as well, too. And, and they, they basically set them up in controlled environment, agricultural type situations. And this is just some, some simulated uh, viewings of what might be going on, say, for instance, if we're dealing with a lunar type surface where you know, half, half of the month is going to be in dark and half is going to be in light, there's going to have to be ways you can capture, you can capture and, you can, and you can store light. Uh, just some other examples, too, of, see here. 
It's not clicking anymore. Just some uh, some other some other examples. Let's see here. On the laptop. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Just uh, just some other examples of of some uh, some portable portable type systems that that. Uh, you know, are, are, are part, of the, part of the thinking process. And the reality is most likely these are going to be underground because there could be some advantages of having some subterranean type systems. Um, I, as I mentioned that um, the best analog is the South Pole. And one of the things that's, that's, that's really has, that uh, has played a role also too is, is, is the psychological aspects of plants as well. And, and that's, well, I think some things, sometimes we kind of overlook that uh, in being in horticulture. And that is that um, just, just all the things we get from horticultural crops, it's just not the nutrition of things. But when you're in a really tough environment, whether it happens to be the South Pole or you're basically confined in a can uh, like you would be in space where you've, you're dealing with very, very harsh situations, anything that reminds you of terra firma, Earth, becomes really important. And again, that's one of the reasons, for instance, that a lot of times the astronauts, the cosmonauts, some of their favorite experiments are with plants because you've got something that reminds you of Earth. It's got some turgor, it's got some flavor, it's got some aroma to you, aroma, aroma to it. It's not, it's not a processed type of food. So that's something that, that uh, I think is, 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 is very much uh, overlooked. I didn't want to super data you guys to, to death, but I, we're doing some interesting stuff with uh, Luis Cisneros and also with with uh, Danielle as well too, and what we've been able to do is um, we can take the plants under hyperbaric conditions and the last, last couple days of the production cycles we can actually expose the plants to low oxygen conditions. And when we do that we can actually increase antioxidant uh, activity and anthocyanins and so we've got some of these value added types of things which uh, could be very advantageous. And I think some of the things we'd like to look in the future Lettuce is not the most nutritionally rich plant to be working with, and so there's some other, there's some much much better crops that we could be uh, looking at from from the standpoint of being able to pursue that. And I'm going to go ahead and stop it here. Uh, they, they basically, we've been growing in a calcine, calcine clay type of media. Uh, there's, there's been quite a bit of work that was, uh, that was done uh, over the years looking at lunar regolith and trying to simulate those materials and what have you. Um, and, I, and I think uh, we're, we're going to be looking at really a sustainable type system. It's almost kind of like a, a, a no plow type system. You know, we're over time, we're, we're using a, a solid, a solid type medium. The, one of the problems you have is Frank Salisbury and company did a lot of work over the years with hydroponics. And hydroponics is great when you've got gravity. But when you don't have gravity, it floats. And so you run into problems with that. And there, there have been certain devices that come up with wicking devices to be able to compensate for that. So I think uh, the calcine clay we're working with is, is something that, that could be realistic from the standpoint of what ultimately could be used in those types of environments as well. Yes, Mike. Good question. Good question. I mean, those, those are all issues that we're going to have to be dealt with. Um, these, these, would be, these would be areas, for instance, which could, you know, could, be, could be manned. I mean, there would be people going in there. So, um, you know, from the, from the standpoint, I, I, don't, I'm, I don't necessarily think you're going to be, you know, taking up, uh, you know, like bumblebees or something like that. But, you know, those, those, are, those are definite issues that, that one, uh, you know, one has to consider. I mean, even, even with uh, tomatoes, for instance, you're going to have to have ways of being able to go ahead and, and pollinate them as, as well, too. Good point. Yes, uh, most Tim. Of your experiments, not all of them, mm -hmm. Right. Do you have any chance to do anything longer term? Is of course most crops. Right, are right. Do you have a chance to see if any of this holds up in a longer time frame? I mean, the trends look pretty clear, but I just wondered if you had. Any yeah, we've uh, Tim. We've actually we've done some uh, from some, from seed to harvest type experiments. So we've done some longer duration experiments. The reason we do these shorter duration ones is that we can get a lot more data in in doing that. Uh, with the longer term, longer term uh, duration things, we see comparable type of responses between low pressure versus ambient. We haven't really tried, for instance, to oxygen stress 
oxygen stress the plants for longer, like for you know 30-day experiments or even longer. We haven't tried, we haven't really oxygen stressed them because, as you know, with seed germination, you can run into problems of low oxygen, and that's that's always a, an issue. But the longer-term thing is really important. You you bring up a good point because you really do need to look at this from the standpoint of seed to harvest, from the standpoint of what's going on. Yes. Yeah, um, we don't we don't have we don't have a, a, a huge history of working with a whole bunch of different species. But with lettuce, for instance, we have definitely seen differences in colobars. Uh, some of the colobars, for instance, which uh, uh, tend tend to, to to have more anthocyanins and what have you, we can find some differences in responses to them. There's still going to be the issues of ethylene that occur. Um, under a confined type of environment, but from the standpoint of phenolic compounds and what have you, yeah, there can be huge differences between, say, for instance, some of your green variety or versus some of, some of those which have higher levels of anthocyanins. And that's another reason, for instance, like we would like to look at some other plant species which naturally have higher levels of antioxidants, which you can, you can uh, pr produce them relatively quickly in a, on a short-term type basis. Yes, that's it. Um, not having not having done it, I really can't honestly answer your question. But one one of the, one of the things um, that that they would do is, I mean, you're dealing first of all with a with a, an inert material, a calcined clay. So that's going to be a high temperature response. You have a relatively sterile type of environment. One of the things they're very concerned about is bringing microbes up, and that's why they do a lot of they put a lot of effort into going ahead and cleaning lysing, cleaning people and sterilizing and and using all this UV and other types of things to go ahead and, and reduce the amount of microbes. Um, I think in terms of long term, I mean, you know, you're a bacteria person and we've, you know, we work on mycorrhiza. I think those are all components that we should ultimately consider in having in, in, uh, in part of the mix up there. And I, and I, would, I would say, for instance, uh, you could see some differences that might go on from the standpoint of low oxygen conditions with, with some of these microbes. But it's something we really haven't, haven't looked at up to now. And I think, for instance, we really need to look at a composition of, of, of some microbes that we can also use in a sustainable type of system, because I think it makes good sense. You've also got these issues of residue as well, too. You know, how do you break down the, you know, the non-edible the non residue, uh, particularly? And so I think there's some, there's some important you know, microbes that we, they should be looking at from that standpoint as well, too. Did I answer your question? Yes. The germination? Uh, the, there's, no, there's no problem at all with uh, germination under low pressure conditions. The, the limiting factor of seed germination is going to become low oxygen. So if, if for instance, we're trying to, if we try, if we try and germinate, germinate seed, for instance, under six, under six kilopascals of oxygen, about third normal, normal oxygen levels, yes, we can, we can have, start to have some seed germination problems. But that's due to a low oxygen effect, not a low pressure effect and everything. And that's, I think, you know, one of the things you'd probably would want to do. You want to be able to control the partial pressures of oxygen so that you don't get into to a hypoxic type of condition or certainly not an anoxic type of condition where, you're, where your oxygen levels get way, way too low. You've got to be able to control that in seed germination. <coughs> but, but, but the pressure's not been an issue at all. And again, too, like some of the data we tried to show you is that when you get into to low oxygen conditions, if you're under hyperbaric conditions, low pressure conditions, there's a greater tolerance to the low oxygen. And part of that's due to the greater gaseous diffusion. It's easier for, easier for the gases to go ahead and, and diffuse and what have you. So that, that plays a role. There's still a depression of growth that goes on, but it's not as great as under high pressure conditions, under low oxygen conditions. Any more questions? Well, we'd like to thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks.